Welcome to the Sunday morning virtual service of Church of the Living God in Winchester, Kentucky. If you've joined us on Facebook, please click the share button and share to your Facebook page so your family and friends can join us now. If you've joined us on YouTube, we ask that you hit the subscribe button and the bell next to it so you'll be notified of our next release. If you are new to us, we encourage you to scan this QR code for more information on our church. Now join us for a time of worship and then the Word from Church of the Living God. Good morning and welcome this morning into the house of the Lord and to just some moments of worship today. We've come together uh, this morning just to bask in His presence to draw near to Him. You know, I'm so thankful that He promised that when we draw near, He'll draw near. He didn't say it had to be any certain day of the week or you had to be dressed any certain way or even that you had to be in a sanctuary. Thank God we are able to draw near to Him today. And He said, I'll draw near right back. And so isn't that a great promise to have this morning? Whether you're up and you're well, or whether you may be laying on the couch not feeling so well, or you may be working wherever you are, whatever you're doing, we just have this, this awesome promise to know that if we draw near, and that's with our hearts, so we begin to pull near to Him in our hearts and our minds today. And He said, I'll draw right back near to you. And so, Father God, this morning we've come on purpose to come close to You, to set our hearts on You, to set our minds on You, to remind ourselves who You are and what You are able to do. That You are in fact higher than any other name and able to do far more exceedingly above the things that we can even ask or think in our hearts today. God, we know that whether we're sick or well, you're still on the throne. Whether we're up or down or discouraged or not discouraged today, you are still God. You're still seated and you're still sovereign. And so today, Father, we've come to lift up your name and to begin to speak about who you are and sing about who you are and to just draw ourselves close to you give you honor, Father, and bow our hearts before you today. You truly are God, and you truly are good to us. And we offer you praise today. We offer you honor. Glorify your name. In all the earth, Lord, just glorify your name. Hallelujah. Yes, we do. Thank you. 
bless you. We bless you, Lord. We bless your name. We bring glory. We bring honor. Blessed be the Lord God. Oh, and blessed be his name. Amen. Forever. Forever. Hallelujah. All the praise. Lord, all the praise today. It belongs to you. What a God you are. What a good Father you are. We praise you. We're so thankful, Lord, for who you are and what you do. Don't you love him today? Don't you love this place called his presence and this place called the shadow of his wings? What a good God. What a good God. We trust in you, Lord. But we put all our trust in you.
so glad. I'm so glad this morning. Oh, for your faithfulness, Lord. Your goodness to me. I bless you, Lord. I bless you. What a great time of worship. Let's continue our worship by giving in one of the following ways. You may text Win City to 77977, or you can give through our COLG app. You can mail it to us at Church of the Living God, 114 Franklin Avenue, Winchester, Kentucky, 40391, or you can drop it by tomorrow at that same address. Additionally, you can scan this QR code and it will take you right to our giving platform online. However you decide, thank you in advance for your faithfulness in paying your tithe and giving your offerings. Now let's get ready to hear from the Word of God today. church family. Good morning. It's good to be with you guys this morning, albeit some different circumstances than we all wish it could be right now. Uh, we wish we could see your faces. We wish we could be with you and hug your necks and shake your hands. But right now, we, we're not able to do that, and that's okay. We thank the Lord that we have this technology and that we're able to gather as a family virtually 
and that we're able to share in what the Lord is doing, what he's speaking, what he's wanting to communicate to his body through these virtual platforms. And we're grateful that even in, in these hours and in this day that we're able to do that. And so we're, we're thankful that the Lord is still speaking, that he's still moving and that he is not disconnected by circumstances. And so from the Thomas household, we miss you guys. We love you guys and we can't wait to see you again. This is the first chance that I've had to uh, address you guys since the new year. So a happy new year from, from us to you guys. We miss you guys and we can't wait to see you again. And we are excited about what the Lord is doing already in this new year. Um, there's an excitement in the air. There's an excitement. I hope you guys feel it. There is an excitement. There always seems to be an excitement with the new year, the turning of the calendar, the fresh start of turning over the page to January 1. There's always an excitement, but there is an excitement in my spirit about what the Lord is doing in this new year and about what he's going to do throughout this year in our families and in the house. And I'm just, um, I'm, I'm anxious to see what the Lord is going to do this year through Church of the Living God and through our families. Amen. Amen. Uh, I have a word this morning that the Lord dropped in my spirit a couple of days ago in prayer, and um, the apostle has been gracious enough to give me an opportunity to share it with you guys. I believe it'll encourage you and, and benefit you and, and lift you guys up. And so uh, I want to take you this morning to 2 Timothy. We're going we're gonna to start um, in the first chapter, and uh, I'll read a verse, and then we'll pray, and then we'll, we'll back up, and we'll kind of dive in. So let's go to 2 Timothy 1 6. 2 Timothy 1 6. I'm reading out of the ESV this morning. I'll reference the King James a couple of times. But 2 Timothy 1 6, Paul says to Timothy, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. One more time. Paul says, For this reason I remind you. Fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. The message this morning is resurrected flames, resurrected flames. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the power and authority of your word. You have said that your word is honored even above your own name. You have promised that heaven and earth would fade away, but your word would remain forever. We thank you, Lord, that through your word, you are able to speak and to move and to breathe and to reach out and to touch your people. And I ask now that this word would go forth with boldness, with power, and with authority. I ask that the ears of these people would be open to hear, that the hearts of these people would be open to receive, that the good seed of the kingdom would be sown into good soil in hearts and minds and lives, and that it would produce good fruit a hundredfold for the kingdom of God, that it would reap a harvest for your glory and for our good, Lord. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. So again, Paul here is writing this book to Timothy. This is his second book to Timothy, obviously, 2 Timothy. And this is Paul's last epistle. This is the last letter that Paul would write. Paul is in chains. Paul is in prison. Paul is facing imminent death. Paul is not um, Paul is not on the horizon of a breakthrough. Paul is not on the horizon of, of good things coming. And Paul is writing this letter to his apostolic son from prison, from chains. And he is encouraging his son. He is giving his son what would be his last words. And how many of you know that the last things that we say are some of the most important things? You think about the last words that people leave with us when we gather around the bedside of loved ones, some of those last words that they impart to us, they're so lasting and meaningful and impactful. And here the apostle, the father to his spiritual son, Timothy, is imparting into him these lasting, impactful words. It's a, it's a, Second Timothy is a very short book, but it's so powerful and it's so pointed and so, so impactful in what the apostle is saying to his spiritual son. And he's trying to get across a point to Timothy. We'll back up and we'll start in verse 3. The first couple of verses, Paul just does his, his standard greeting, basically. In verse 3, Paul says, I thank God, whom I serve, 
as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Verse 4, Paul goes on, as I remember your tears, I long to see you that I might be filled with joy. <clears throat> Paul in verse 4 says, I remember your tears. When we, oftentimes when we read through the Bible, we will we miss context. We miss the the application of the context of the situation. If you go from First Timothy right into Second Timothy, you might miss the context of the situation here. In First Timothy, uh, at the end of chapter four into chapter five, Paul is encouraging Timothy to put into practice the gifts that are in him, to put into practice. Um, the calling that is upon his life. He's encouraging Timothy, listen, do what you've been called to do, strive, effort, do what you've, do what you've been assigned to do. And, and here, as we come into 2 Timothy, we've got to realize that the situation has changed a little bit, that Paul is, is, in, a, is in a bad spot. Paul is in a bad spot. Paul's, Paul's in, encouraged because he knows that the end is him getting to see the Lord Jesus. But Paul's in a bad spot, and Timothy, Timothy is downtrodden. Timothy is, if we're just being honest, Timothy's depressed. Timothy is pretty upset about the circumstance. Paul says in verse 4, I remember your tears as I long to see you that I might be filled with joy. Paul's first chapter of this letter here, it obviously wasn't broken up into chapters when he wrote it, but the first beginning of this letter here to Timothy, Paul is trying to bring Timothy out of this, this momentary lapse of, of encouragement because Timothy is feeling down. The man who Timothy has leaned on, the apostolic father, the, the leader that Timothy has looked to is reaching the end of his life and death is almost certain for Paul. Nero would execute Paul not long after he wrote Second Timothy and Timothy's depressed about it. And Paul is saying, listen, I know about your tears, and I long to see you that I might be filled with joy. In verse 5, he goes on, he said, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. The word for sincere here is genuine, without hypocrisy, not disguised or concealed, but open. Paul here is trying to build up Timothy, and he says, listen, Timothy, he says, I know, I know you want to be, I know, I know the situation doesn't look good. I know the situation doesn't feel good, but remember, you have a faith, and not just a faith, but you have a sincere faith. You have a genuine faith, a faith that is not disguised, a faith that is open, a faith that is not concealed. But Paul says, you have a faith that has been, that has been, uh, that has been tested and tried and you have, you have proven your faith. Paul says, I'm sure this faith dwells in you as well as it did in your grandmother and in your mother. That word for I am sure, it means I'm persuaded. How many of you know to be persuaded of something, you need some evidence? Paul says, Timothy, I've seen, I've, I've, taken, I've taken inventory, I've watched your life and I'm persuaded that there is a faith in you that is genuine. I know the circumstance looks bad. I know my chains don't look good. I know the things going on around us seem bad. But remember the sincere, genuine faith that is in you. Listen, 2020, folks, was not the best year on record. It was not the greatest highlight year for all of us, there were people that lost jobs and there were people that lost loved ones and there were people that had to say goodbye to some things. But I want to remind you that we have a sincere and genuine faith that, that we can be persuaded of. There is evidence of our faith. There is evidence of our faith. Friends, we have been through some things. 2020, 2020 was hard, but we have a sincere genuine faith and we have been through some things and our faith is in us. There is a faith in us that is sure and genuine that we can be persuaded of because of what we have been through, because of the mountains that we have climbed, because of the valleys that he has seen us through. There is a sincere and genuine open faith 
that we can cling to. We have to be reminded, friends, that 2020 is not the end of the book. 2020 is not the end. 2020 is not the final page, that there is more that is yet to come, that there is more that is ahead of us, that He is not done. The Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they are not done working on us. They are not done moving in our lives. And it is the faith that is in us that we can be confident of. Paul would go on in verse 6, For this reason, because of the genuine faith, because of the faith that I am persuaded of that is in you, because there is a faith that is in you that I know, that I know, that I know you have. Because of this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. When you read this on the surface, it sounds, it sounds great. It sounds awesome. It sounds encouraging. And, and I, I'll just be honest here, for years when I read this, and I didn't, I didn't study it out, when I read fan into flame, or the King James will say, stir up the gift, I, I read it as in the context of 1 Timothy. I read it in context of putting into practice the gift. I read it in the context of taking the small thing that God had given and making it bigger, taking the tiny deposit that God had given and making it larger. Does that make sense? I, had, I read it in the context of, okay, you've got a certain amount. Now take the certain amount and, and enlarge the certain amount that God had given you. But this isn't what Paul is saying. For The word for fan into flame here is to kindle up and it speaks of the remains of a fire, embers. Specifically, this word means to kindle anew. To rekindle, and listen to this, it means to resuscitate. To resuscitate. Paul says, for this reason, I remind you to resuscitate the gift or the gifts of God which are in you through the laying on of my hands. Paul says, there are things in you that you have allowed to die to the place of an ember. There are giftings in you. There are dreams in you. There are hopes in you that whether it be circumstances or situations or whatever it may be, they have, they have caused the mighty flame that was once burning bright and burning hot and burning like a wildfire. Now that flame, that fire has burned down and it has burned to an ember. And once what was once a, a mighty fire that was burning hot is now but an ember that remains. And Paul is not saying, take this small gift and make it big. Paul is saying, take this dying thing. Take this thing that is dead. Take this thing that has, that has just, a, 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 just a, a barely a little bit of light remaining in it. And I want you to start to fan it. Because what is almost dead can once again become a burning fire. What is almost gone out can again become enraged and burning with brightness and hotness again. Paul says, what is the, the dreams and the hopes and the desires that are in you, that the Lord put in you through me when I laid my hands on you, those things that, that the circumstances of life, that the, that the tears of your circumstances have, have drowned down to just, a, just ash and ember, the Lord wants to cause them to burn again. I feel this in my spirit. There are things that 2020 has put a damper on. There are things that 2020 has caused that were once burning bright and hot in people's lives and they have now burned down and they are but ash and ember in the lives of God's people. And I hear the Lord saying that He wants those things to burn bright and hot and furious again. He has not called us to be a people, church, that just have an ember burning in their lives. He has called us, as Jesus said, to be the light of the world, not to be the ash of the world, not to be the embers of the world, but He has called us to be the light of the world, to burn bright, to burn hot, to be the light that draws all people unto Him, to be the city that is on the hill. And He wants the dreams and the desires and the hopes that He has put in you and in me to not barely burn, but to burn with vigor, to burn with heat, to burn with intensity, to not, to not be a small spark or a small flame, but to be a wild, consuming fire. 
The scripture says that he is a consuming fire. He is a consuming fire. Our God is not some little spark or little flame, but He is a consuming fire. And when He touches the dream of a man or a woman, when He touches the dream of a, of a son or a daughter, it does not come out as a spark. It does not come out as an ember. It comes out as a consuming fire because that's what He is, a consuming fire. Our God wants to consume us with a burning fire. He wants the dreams within us to burn again church. 2020 put a damper on some of those dreams. 2020 put a, a lid on some of the dreams of our hearts and some of the dreams of our hopes, but he wants to burn them again. He wants them to burn again in us. He doesn't want us to abandon the things that he has put in us. Paul said, the gift of God, which is in you, which is in you. There are dreams and desires and hopes that are in us, church. Not dreams and desires that are out there somewhere that we've got to go looking for, but things that are in us, that He has planted and seeded within us, that we know, that we know, that we know, that that's what He's called and assigned me to do. That that's what He's put inside me that I want to pursue. But we've said, not now. I can't do it during a pandemic. I can't do it during this economic session. I can't do it because I lost a loved one last year. I can't do it because I lost my job last year. I can't do it because the circumstances are too difficult right now or because the, this, the situation in the country is too volatile right now. I feel the Lord saying, I want your flame to burn bright again. And not for the circumstances to determine the hotness of the fire of the gifts that I have given. He said, I want you to resuscitate, to, to resurrect those flames, to resurrect those flames. Verse 7 of 2 Timothy 1, we love to quote this in church, but this is a continuation of verse 6. It's all one sentence. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and of self-control. This is all one sentence, church. We love quoting 2 Timothy 1.7, but it's, a, it's all one sentence. Verse 6 and 7 are all one sentence. It would read like this. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and of self-control. Paul says, resuscitate the flame that is within you because you don't have a spirit of fear. You have a spirit of power and of love and of self-control. Don't be afraid of the circumstances. Don't fear what man can do unto you. Don't fear the world that's around you. But be powerful and of a sound mind. And be, be, be not afraid, but have love in your heart. And know that whatever he's put in you, he can bring out of you and do through you. Verse 8, Paul goes on. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. The word for share in suffering here in the King James, it says, be a partaker of the afflictions. In other words, Paul says, don't, don't fade away. Don't fade away when it gets hard. Don't shy back, Timothy. I know I'm in prison and I know I'm in chains. I know there's a global pandemic and I know the economy is volatile and the stocks are up one day and down the next. And I know people everywhere are losing their job. And I know that unemployment is through the roof. And I know that a new administration is taken over in a few days and there's question marks about what's going to happen here and what's going to happen there. And I know that there's all kinds of questions, but don't fade away. Don't draw back. Paul says, lean in. Be a partaker, share, lean in by the power of God. By the power of God. You're not required to do it on your own. It's by the power of God. It is by the power of God that we can lean in in this hour. That we don't have to wait, church, until the virus is done for Him to start burning bright within us. We don't have to wait until the economy gets settled for Him to burn bright within us. We don't have to wait until he fixes whatever the issue is that scares us for him to burn bright within us. By the power of the Holy Ghost, I can lean in right this moment to what he's doing. 
I can lean in right this moment to what he's doing now. Verse 9, by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. It's not because of us. It's not because of me. It is because of him who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. Paul says, Timothy, if he saved you and if he called you, not because of your own works, but because of his own purpose and grace, then it will be his own purpose and grace that brings you into the fullness of what he's put in your heart. Church, friend, brother, sister, if he saved you and called you by his own purpose and grace, not by your works, then it will be his own purpose and grace that resuscitates and satisfies and fulfills the calling and the gifting and the purposes that are in you. It's not by my works. It's not by my works. I sat with the Lord this week as he put this on my heart. And he, as I was in prayer and he put this scripture on my heart and I, I, went, to the, I went to the Greek and I thought, oh wow, he's not... He's not talking about building something from small to big. He's talking about bringing something back to life. He's talking about, when he talks about fanning into flame, he's talking about bringing something back to life. And I thought that's so good. And as I sat with the Lord in prayer, I said, Lord, there are people and me at times, we're, what do we do if we're too tired to fan into flame? What do we do if we're too tired to stir it up? What? What are we supposed to do if we can't do it? What are we supposed to do if our arm is too tired to fan? If our arm is too tired to stir? I said, what are we supposed to do? Because the word says, you fan into flame. And verse 7 says that we haven't been given a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and self-control. And so it feels like, you know, I got to pick myself up by the bootstraps. But then verse 8 says that it's by the power of God. I said, I said Lord, I don't... I don't know what I'm supposed to do because there are people out there that are beat down. They are worn out. And you know what? They don't have the power. They don't have the strength to pick up the fan and, fl and fan the flame. And they don't have the strength to pick it up and stir the gift anymore. And I felt the Lord say, let me breathe on the embers. Let me breathe on the embers. You know, there's, there's something called, I saw this week, there's something called a fire triangle. And the, the fire triangle tells us how a fire is fueled. And there is heat, there is fuel, and there is oxygen. And these are the three elements that fuel a fire. Heat, fuel, and oxygen. His breath can breathe upon those dying embers of the flames of our hearts when we're too weak and we're too tired and we're too beat down and worn out to pick up the fan and flame that those embers in our own lives. I felt the Lord say this week that if we would let him breathe on those embers, if we would let him breathe on those embers, that he would again cause them to burn like a hot fire. Because Paul said, it's not because of our works, but it is because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. It's not because of us. How, how, how crazy would it be if salvation was, if the, if the gift of salvation was just given, but then all of the things to accomplish, I had to figure out on my own. If salvation was a gift, we're not saved by works, but by grace, lest any man should boast. So salvation is given, but how crazy would it be if salvation was a gift and then I had to accomplish on my own, by my own power, all of the dreams and the hopes that he's put on my heart? That doesn't make any sense. If salvation, which is the greatest gift, is given, then how much more should I lean into him? Yes, to come into agreement with what he wants to do, but also to lean into his grace, to his purpose, to his working, to his will, to accomplish all that he put on my heart. It's not by my work. It's by leaning into him. It's by laying on his chest. It's by allowing him to breathe on those embers, to breathe on the dead things. He is the resurrection and the life, he told Martha. John, I think, it's, I think it's John 11, 
Lazarus is dead. Martha comes out to meet Jesus and she says, if you were here, he wouldn't have died. But I know that he's going to raise again one day in the resurrection. And Jesus says, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. When Jesus walks into the circumstance, when we allow Jesus to walk into the situation, when we allow Jesus to walk into where we're at, to walk into our dreams, to walk into our hopes that he's put on our heart, to walk into the desires that he has sown into us, he brings life and light. In him is life, and that life was the light of man, John 1 says. He can't help but bring life into a circumstance. It's just who he is. And so when we allow him to walk in and to breathe on those dead, dying things in our life, it causes them to live again. And that's what he wants to do, church. Not because, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace which he gave us in Christ Jesus and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. See, he brings life. Abolished death and brought life and immortality to light. When Jesus walks in, he abolishes death and brings life and immortality. That's what Jesus does. That's who he is. When he walks in, he abolishes death and brings life and immortality to light through the gospel for which I, Paul, was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But here we go. But I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed. Church, we better be confident in who we believe. We better be confident in whom we have believed in this hour. And in, 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 in this hour, when, when the world wants to say you can't, when the world wants to say that dream will never happen, when the world wants to say in, in, in this circumstance you, that can't be accomplished, we better be confident in whom we have believed. But I am not ashamed for whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. The word for guard here is to, to keep watch, to guard that it may remain safe, to keep from being snatched away, to preserve safe and unimpaired. Paul says, I know whom I have believed, and I know that he will guard what has been entrusted to me. I know that he will guard, he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Paul said, listen, Timothy, I know it doesn't look good. But I am confident that regardless of what it looks like, that he who I have believed in is able to guard what he has put in my heart. That he is able to keep it from being snatched away. That he is able to keep it from being impaired even, the word, the definition says. Not just from being snatched away, but to preserve it safe. To preserve it from being impaired. To preserve it unimpaired, to preserve safe and unimpaired, and to keep safe from being snatched away. Not only will the dream not be snatched away, not only will those things that he's sown into my soul not be snatched away totally, but they will be unimpaired. They will be safe completely and totally because he is guarding them. I'm not guarding them. He is guarding them. He has entrusted them to me and I have laid them back into his hands and said, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, you have entrusted me with this dream and this vision and now I put it into your hands and I say to you, the only way that this can come to pass is if you do it. So I put it back into your hands. I deposit it back into your hands and I say, do it in and through me. And Paul said, I'm confident. I'm confident that he'll guard it. I'm confident that he'll guard it. Verse 13 and 14, and I'll close. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Verse 14, here he goes. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. By the Holy Spirit that is in us, guard the good deposit that is entrusted to you. 2020 was a tough year. It was tough on a lot of folks. Um, some people lost jobs. Some people um, lost loved ones. 
Some people had to lay down dreams and hopes. Um, some people didn't have to lay down dreams and hopes and visions, but some people chose to lay down dreams and hopes and visions because they thought, you know, in this environment, there's no way that what I'm feeling, what I'm pursuing, what I'm believing for can come to pass. And I just, as I, as I was in prayer this week, I just felt the Lord say that I want to bring back the fire for the dreams and the hopes and the, the visions that I put into people. You know, there are things that he has sown into us, church, that we have not been forced to lay down, but we've laid down on our own because we thought it can't happen right now or it's too big right now or it's, it's too high, it's too vast, it's too wide right now. And, and we got to get, I got to get to a certain place and, and then I'll start believing God again. I, I got to get myself to a certain place and then I'll start believing God for that again. Once I get there, then I can believe God to do that again because then I'll be ready to do and he can come in and do and, and then it'll all work out. And I just, I just felt the Lord say there, there, are, there are dreams that were once flames that were burning bright and hot that have died out to embers. And I want to resuscitate and revive and resurrect those fires again. And so I want to pray with you this morning that that whatever it is, whatever it is, whether it be whether it be a business or whether it be your kids that aren't in church anymore that you you've been praying for that they come back to church and and you thought, you know, I've been praying for 15 years and they haven't come back yet. Or, you know, you, you thought the Lord had called you into ministry and you've been believing and preparing yourself in, in the secret place and, and you haven't been called out into public yet and you thought, well, that's never going to happen. I just, I just feel the Lord breathing on the dying embers of fires again to bring them back to life. And so I want to pray with you this morning. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you that you are a reviving God, a resurrecting God. Jesus, you told Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I don't bring resurrection and life. I am the resurrection and the life. And Jesus, when you show up, you bring resurrection and life. And I ask right now, by your Holy Spirit, that you would breathe into the hearts of your people. Breathe into the spirits of your people. Breathe on the dead and dying things that they have put aside, that they have laid down, that they have said, I don't think this is ever going to happen. I don't think this is ever going to come to pass. This thing is too big. This thing is too much. This isn't for me. This was just a pizza dream. This was just an imagination. This was just me thinking outside the box. This wasn't God. This was just my, my own thoughts, my own hopes, my own wishes. Lord, breathe again on the embers that are dying and resurrect them, Lord. And bring to life 2 Timothy 1.7 that they have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That they would pursue relentlessly what you have put on their hearts. And as they draw near to you, that your Holy Spirit and the wind and the breath of your Holy Spirit would cause those embers to turn into burning flames. And we thank you for it, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Church, we love you. And we are excited to see you again soon. We can't wait. God bless you guys.